Plus, and we're going to take a look at the counting loop, because in C++ there's only one counting loop, and that is the for statement. So let's take a look at the syntax. Okay, the syntax is for, and in parentheses, expression 1, expression 2, expression 3, with semicolons separating them, not uh, anything but semicolons, not colons, not commas, semicolons, and then statement. So statement is the body of the loop. That is what's going to get repeated. The reserved word is for. Statement is, as before, a simple C++ statement or a compound statement with requisite semicolons. Expression 1, expression 2, and expression 3 are valid C++ expressions that can be evaluated. Now, how does it work? Well, this is how it goes. When execution begins with the for statement, that is when the compiler reaches this point here, expression 1 is going to be executed and executed only one time. What does it do? Expression 1 will initialize the loop control variable and it is possible to declare the loop control variable here and I'll show examples of this. What happens next? The next thing that happens is expression 2 is executed. That is the check of the loop control variable. If that is true, then statement will be executed. When that becomes false, then control passes out of the for statement and down to the next statement, whatever that might be. Okay, so if expression 2 is true, statement is going to be executed. And then what? Control passes up to expression 3. Expression 3 is the update of the loop control variable. So the loop control variable is updated, and then once again, control goes to expression 2, and that is checked. The loop control variable is checked. If true, statement is executed, and then expression 3, and again expression 2. True, statement. Expression 3, expression 2. Statement. Expression 3, expression 2. Statement. When we get to the point where we update and then check, and it becomes false, then control passes out of the for statement. Let's take a look at some examples. I'm going to start with bad form. This is a prime example of bad form here. You see that the person has created a empty expression 1 and an empty expression 3. Does that mean that it's not going to work? Actually not. It can still work. In this case, the expression 1, the initialization of the loop control variable, there's nothing there to execute. We check to see if sum not equal 4 is true or false. If it's true, then we execute the body of the loop, the statement, which in this case is a C out and a C in. So here we go. We prompt the user with what is 2 plus 2. We read in the sum. Now let's suppose that that is 6. Somebody types in 6. Alright, so the initialization occurs and then we check. Is sum, which is 6, not equal to 4? That's true. So we output incorrect answer. Prompt read in sum. Suppose they type in 7. What happens then? Well, the update of the loop control variable is executed. That's expression 3 here, which doesn't exist. And then we check again. Well, is 7 not equal to 4? That's true, and so we execute the body again. And that's going to continue on until sum is 4, which is the same as 4, so 4 not equal to 4 is false, and then we jump out of the loop. But this is very, very bad form. You should never write a for loop like this. Again, as I indicated in the last lesson, some people simply love to use the counting loop modified to handle all sorts of situations, and you really should not do that. Okay, moving right along, example 1 here. So we have average is a float, sum is long, and short i is 0. We prompt for a positive number, read in max. 4, i equal to 0, i less than or equal to max, i plus plus. So the initialization is that i is 0. We check, is 0 less than max? Suppose that max is 4. Suppose that's what's entered. It's true, and so I'm going to add into sum what i is. So I add 0 into the sum. So sum, which is 0 initially, is 0, 0 plus 0, 0. Then I increment the index, the loop control variable, and check, is it less than max? Well, it's now 
1. 1 is less than max, so I run the statement. I add 1 into the sum. Then I increment again. It's now 2. 2 is less than max. So I run the body again, and I continue until I reach 4. So what I've done is I've summed up the positive integers, and then I'm going to calculate an average and output that. Okay. So we declare our variables, initializing our accumulator. In the very end, we're going to use a static cast to make sure that average is a floating point type. OK, suppose that I want to change things just a little bit. The same process, except that I'm going to add every other integer. I can simply change the updating process so it's not i++, but i plus equals 2 and that's going to add 2 each time. Now I've noticed in this slide that I have miscalculated my average, so I'm going to put a big not equals there, but you see the point of the slide nonetheless. Okay, now we've got a bigger problem. Here our goal is to produce this pattern of stars. This is perhaps not quite as easy as one might think. My first thought is, in this example, that I'm going to create a loop that is going to output the number of rows. And we'll take the dimension of this pattern to be 5. We'll just fix it at 5, knowing that I could make it a variable. Okay, so outputting 5 lines, I would simply do a for loop. int i equals 1 to 5, i++, plus plus c out in line. Okay, that's just simply going to output 5 lines. Now, notice in this case, I've introduced the concept of declaring my index, my loop control variable, inside the loop here. So i is local to this for statement. What that means is, outside of the for statement, out here, uh, i doesn't exist. If I were to try to do something like this, see out i, all right? the compiler would come back and say, no, you can't do that. i doesn't exist. It's an undeclared variable. So i is local to that loop. Then I'm thinking, OK, how do I output five stars? Well, I can do that with another for loop. I go one to five, increasing by one, and outputting just a star. So if I put these two together, I'm going to have an outer loop. 4 int i equal 1 to 5 i plus plus and an inner loop for int j equal 1 j less than or equal 5 j plus plus c out star and then an inline so I'm going to bring back the cursor to the beginning of the line after outputting five stars and I'm going to do that five times then maybe I'm going to get what I want well let's take a look here's here's our output and this is going to keep track of our variables, our loop control variables. So beginning with i equal to 1 and j equal to 1. Now remember, i is 1. This is the first time through the outer loop. And the very first time through the inner loop, I'm going to ask, OK, j is 1. Is it less than 5? Yes, I'm going to output a star. Then I increment, check, and output a star. Increment, check, output a star. Increment, check, output a star. Increment, check, output a star. Increment, now I'm up to 6. j is 6. Is 6 less than or equal to 5? No. So I jump out of the loop. I do an inline, which is going to put the cursor down here. And I go back to the beginning of the outer for loop. I increment i. i is now 2. So I come down inside and start the inner for loop all over again. j is 1. That's less than 5. Output a star. Increment to 2. That's still less than 5. Output a star. Increment to 3. Still less than 5. Output a star. 4. Less than 5. Output a star. 5. Less than or equal to 5. Output a star. And then I say, whoops, hmm, I messed up. I didn't want that star. I wanted 4 stars on the second line. And I wanted 3 on the third, 4 on the fourth, and 1 on the 5th. I think I got that right. OK, so what's going on here? What do I realize at this point? What I realize is that the number of stars, so this loop is stars, has to be a function of the line number. You have more stars, the smaller the line number. So 
either j or the limiting value of j has to be some function of i. So let's see. What we actually got was this, and our goal was this. So let's give it another shot. The outer loop is going to stay the same, but let's look at the inner loop here. I have 4 int j equal 1, j less than or equal to 5 minus i. Well, let's just keep it right there for a second. If I start there, i is 1, so j is going to start at 1 and go to 5 minus 1. That would be 4. I get 4 stars on the first line. Well, that's not quite right, so I'm going to add that 1 back in. Notice that as i increases, that is, as the line number increases, then the number of stars is going to decrease because I'm subtracting that i. So let's check it out, see how it goes. i is 1, j is 1, that's less than 5 minus 1 plus 1, which is 5, output a star. Increment, check, output. Increment, check, output. Increment, check, output. Increment, check, output. Increment, now I'm up to 6, is that less than 5? No, I jump out of the loop, hit the end line, that puts my cursor down here again. So I go back to the outer for loop and inc increment i. i is now 2. Start in again with the inner loop, j is 1. Now, with i equal to 2, so I have 5 minus 2 plus 1 is 4. So my limit is 4, remember that. So is 1 less than 4? Yes. Output a star. Increment, it's 2, less than 4. Output a star. Increment, 3, less than 4. Output a star. Increment, 4, less than or equal to 4. Output a star. Increment, it's 5. It's no longer less than or equal to 4. I'm out of that loop. I hit the end line puts me down to the next line, go up here, increase i to 3. Now if I put 3 in here, I have 5 minus 3 plus 1 is 3. So my limiting value is 3 on j. I jump in here, j is 1, less than 3, output a star, increment. 2, less than 3, output a star, increment. 3, less than or equal to th 3, output a star, increment. 4. 4 is not less than or equal to 3. I jump out of the loop, hit the end line, brings my cursor back to the beginning of the next line, increment i to 4 now. If I put 4 in here, then I have 5 minus 4 plus 1 is 2. So my limit is 2. Start j at 1. Is that less than 2? Yes. Output a star. Increment 2. Less than or equal to 2? Yes. In star. Increment. I'm up to 3. Is that less than or equal to 2? No. So I'm out of the loop. Increment i. i is now 5, and my limit is what? It's 1. 5 minus 5 plus 1 is 1. Start i at 1. Okay, output a star. Increment. It's 2. That's not less than 1. I jump out. I increment i. i is 6. 6 is not less than 5, and I jump out. So I've managed to produce the output that I want, and it's the two nested for loops. Okay, if you take a look at this goal, now I've got a new pattern. It's very similar, except what? Well, I've got spaces before the stars. So I'm going to need what? I'm going to need an outer loop for the number of rows. I'm going to need an inner loop for a number of spaces. So zero spaces on the first line, one space on the second, two on the third, three on the fourth, and etc. four on the fourth. And if you want to think of it, that's why there's five on the last. And then, of course, I need a for loop to generate the number of stars after the spaces. So here we go. The outer for loop and the inline, that's for the rows. The first for loop, that's for the number of spaces. And the second for loop, that's for the number of stars following the spaces. So I'll output the right number of spaces, output the right number of stars, hit the inline, and start over again. Okay, let's talk about scope. You can create a scope in C++. You do this by a statement or a compound statement. A statement like a while loop, a do while loop, an if, a for. That produces a new scope. Every time you set in a set of curly braces, you've produced a new scope. Well, in this case, take a look. I have i declared inside this for loop. 
What this means is that I exists only inside this for statement. So will this piece of code compile? The answer is no. When the compiler reaches this point, it sees this variable I, it's not been declared. It existed in the scope of the for loop, which is right there, but not outside. Now to clarify things, let's put in some curly braces. This doesn't change a thing. If I had written C out I, without the quotes, of course, a compiler would not complain. It would say, yes, I is 1 and 2 and 3, etc. Once I get outside, out to here, I no longer exists. Whether or not I have the curly braces is immaterial. Okay, let's take a look at this situation. Notice I have I, I've declared I here, and I have I inside the for loop. So, is that the same I? Yes, it is. Now, this I here is the same as that I, is the same as that I. When I leave that for loop, I is what? I is 11. Not a problem. I've declared the index I outside of the for loop. What happens when I do this? Now I have I set equal to 20, but I also declare I inside the for loop. Well, what's happening here is what's called hiding. I have a variable i in the inner scope, the inner block of code, that is this for loop. It's inside the scope of main, which means now I've got two i's. But as soon as I get into the inner scope, the inner block, this i will hide that i. So when I am inside the for loop, I goes from 1 up to 11. And as soon as I jump out and execute this line of code, what I'm going to get is what? Will I get 11 or 20? Well, the answer is 20, because this i is that i. This i here disappears. It goes out of scope. And that is all about counting loops and scope.